Hey, if you love Latina to Latina, and I know you do, and you want to support the show, it's as easy as listening on Radio Public, a free, super easy app that works on iPhone and Android. When you listen to Latina to Latina on Radio Public, we earn a little bit with every episode you hear. Thanks for listening and for loving the show. If we avoid the worst and we're able to adapt in a way where we really kind of change our approach to things like equity and how we deal with the environment, if we do that, and I want my son to know I was a part of it, even just a small part of it, but part of it. And if we don't and we fail, I want him to know that I tried. Nicole Hernandez-Hammer was an established climate scientist and respected academic. But a few years ago, she left it all behind. Her sense of urgency about climate change pushed her to direct advocacy. Since then, her work has made her a national leader in environmental justice, even earning her an invitation to join Michelle Obama at the 2015 State of the Union. Today, she and I trace her passion for saving the planet back to her upbringing in rural Guatemala and discuss the loneliness of being a Latina in STEM. Like me, you'll end up inspired to do your part. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. You were born in Guatemala of Cuban heritage. How did that happen? My dad went to medical school in Guatemala, and he met my mom there. And she's Guatemalan? With Guatemalan, yes. So can I, as a Cuban, count you as one of my own? Sure. Okay, good. Um, That'd be great. (laughs) Early on, what was your awareness of the environment? So my father, being Cuban and going to medical school in Guatemala, he was at a disadvantage. So Guatemalan doctors got to do their residency in the city, and foreign doctors had to find it somewhere else in the country. And so we went to Quiche in the highlands of Guatemala. And I remember, I was very small, but we would take a small plane out there and then get in a truck and drive out to a Mayan village. And um, he did everything from deliver babies to pull teeth. And we lived in a little trailer in the middle of the jungle. And it was amazing. We would wash, hand wash our clothes in the river. And I would climb trees and eat fruit out of the trees. And at night, we could hear the wild animals walking around our mobile home. And for me, that just left such an incredible kind of impression and love of nature and feeling like that was my place. And so when we moved to the United States... Where did you move? When I was about four years old. Where to? To right outside of Baltimore, Randallstown, which is nothing like (laughs) Quiche, Guatemala. (laughs) And my mother and I, we both felt... Um, starved for nature. And so we went out walking from our apartment building looking for like a little forest or something and we found kind of someone's yard (laughs) and they had a little river and we would sneak there from time to time and sit by the river, look at the trees, collect the rocks (laughs) and sneak back to our apartment just because we felt so distant from where we had been. Looking back, What would you say was the first scientific thing you ever did as a kid? Actually, it was an experiment that I didn't realize I was doing. Um, (laughs) I didn't know that caterpillars turned into butterflies when we first came to the U.S. And so there was this tree outside of our house that was covered in caterpillars. And I just thought they were the cutest thing. So I went and I like had them all over my arms and on my face. (laughs) And my mom said, "Okay, you could take one inside. So we went inside and we took one of those plastic Coke bottles, and we cut off the the top and made a little habitat for him. And we put him in there. And every day after school, I would come in and check on him. Then one morning, I woke up and he was gone. But there was just like a little a little casing there, which I didn't know what it was. So I was really disappointed. And I went to my mom and I said, the caterpillar is gone. <laughs> and, and she's like, well, just wait, maybe he'll come back. So I waited. And I'm like, I'm just going to throw this out. He's no. he left. And she's like, well, just give it another day. <laughs> and so one morning I woke up and there was a butterfly flying inside the Coke container. And I was so excited. And I was like, see, that's where butterflies come from. And so we went outside and, and let it out. And I thought that was just the coolest experiment. <laughs> and uh, it really turned me on to science. 
At the end of each of our episodes, we ask our listeners to send us their thoughts, their requests, and we've been getting just a ton of requests for Latinas in STEM. And so sitting here with you as a Latina in STEM, what is that experience like? Lonely and hard, I think. Thank you for being honest about that. (laughs) How did you, how do you mitigate that loneliness? By having a life that's more than just one thing. So I'm a scientist, but I also love spending time with my family and spending time with friends and gardening and doing yoga and all these different things. And then also talking to a lot of young women and girls about STEM and climate change. I'm really lucky. Every few months I get an email from a young Latina that's interested in writing about me as kind of their STEM role model, which I feel like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> there should be better ones. And they choose me and it's like, uh, it's, <laughs> it's I'm so rolling my eyes, flattered. Nicole. And it's so nice. And I kind of overdo it because I'm like, call me, we'll talk, <laughs> whatever you need. <laughs> I will help you figure it out, you know. So I see that shift already happening mm-hmm. and it's so exciting. And it's so exciting that I could help encourage folks to kind of reach beyond anything that I've, I've done in my career. Being the only Latina in most of my science classes and certainly not having any Latinos, let alone, you know, Latinas um, to look up to in terms of mentors, kind of put it upon me to do better, to represent my community. And so that that's that's tough. So you kind of have to do both. You have to represent your community at the same time. You want to hold your own as a scientist and not feel like you're going to only be doing research that affects your community. So I actually stayed away from that for a long time until... Stayed away from? From incorporating my perspective as a Latina into the work that I was doing as a Mm -hmm. scientist. And later I realized it was a huge mistake. How did you realize that? Because it's an advantage. I have a different perspective. And when you're in a room and everybody's coming from the same experience and the same perspective, the research is going to be one note Mm -hmm. and coming into the research with the experiences I had as a child, as an immigrant, as a woman, as a person of color, helped me perceive different dynamics within research, even just speaking two languages. When you read a narrative, you're better able to craft it because you can think of words differently when you're bilingual. So I started to bring that in more into my work. And that's really the most exciting part of my career is when I started to do that. Was there a moment when that crystallized for you? Yeah, I was working on a report looking at the impacts of sea level rise on transportation infrastructure in Florida. And I was looking at different sea level rise projections and Climate Central had some good work on that. And I happened upon a list that they had put together of the places that are most vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise. So Florida, Texas, New York. Latino, Latino, Latino. Exactly. (laughs) Like, I know these places. This could be a map for something else. Yeah, and the research for a long time had showed how Latinos and, in general, communities of color are disproportionately vulnerable to the impacts of pollution. But at the time, we weren't talking about how those same communities are disproportionately vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And so I thought, well, this is such an important thing to be talking about. At the same time, I was doing something called ground truthing, where you you make a map that shows where flooding should be happening, and then you go to that place to verify the elevation. I decided to go to that place to verify the elevation on the days of the highest tides. So what is the lowest point I could find on Miami Beach? Alton and 10th. And when are the highest tides going to hit? In the fall. So I went out there with one of my graduate students, and we were looking at our maps, and we were standing there, and it was one of those beautiful Miami days where there's not a cloud in the sky. Mm -hmm. And at first I'm like, well, I mean, we're probably not going to see anything. There's still a kind of a sense of denial because it just sounds too, like, awful to be true. And then water started coming in from the storm drains and filling up the street. Even though it's not raining? Not a drop of rain. It hadn't rained, I think, for a week at that point. Wow. And the water just started coming up, and it was salt water. And within 15 minutes, there were about, I don't know, eight or nine inches of standing water on that corner. And 
And I couldn't believe it was happening. And I couldn't believe that the people that were just caring about their day and just kind of dealing with it probably didn't know why that was happening and probably did not understand that it was going to get worse. And so at that point, I decided that I have an opportunity and an obligation and a duty as a scientist, as a mother, as a Latina, to sound the alarm. And so I switched gears. And over the following year, I moved away from academia into outreach and education. There weren't other Latinas talking to Latinos about climate change at the time. And so if I wasn't doing it, then who was going to do it? When to start a family is a really personal decision. Some of us want kids now, and some of us aren't sure if we'll ever want them. Before I got pregnant with my daughter, my friends and I would often talk about how we wished we knew more about our own fertility, because the not knowing only made decisions and plans more confusing. I wish at the time I'd had access to Modern Fertility's at-home hormone fertility test. I recently took their fertility quiz and explored their timeline tool. It helped me think about how many kids I want, when I plan to have them, and how my hormones play into those decisions. Modern Fertility is really convenient. They ship a kit to your home and a physician reviews your results, which arrive in a few days. Similar tests could run over $1,000 at a doctor's office, but Modern Fertility gives you access to this information for $159. And you can even use a work-flexible spending account or health savings account. In addition to your kit, Modern Fertility connects you with a fertility nurse. You can also join their weekly webinar and participate in their active online community. Most of all, Modern Fertility offers peace of mind by giving you knowledge and information to help inform some of life's biggest decisions. Tests are conducted in a CLIA certified lab and affiliated physicians and clinical advisors work at top fertility clinics. Visit modernfertility.com Latina. Take their fertility quiz and get $20 off your Modern Fertility test. That's modernfertility.com slash Latina to take the fertility quiz and get $20 off. Modernfertility.com slash Latina. It's hard to believe that there are still climate change deniers, but there are. What, in your experience, is the most effective way of dealing with someone who either doesn't believe that the climate is changing and or doesn't believe that it's man-made? So as a scientist, I had the opportunity to speak with elected officials about climate change. And when I went as a scientist, I had graphs and charts and numbers that I thought were incredibly compelling. Mm -hmm. And I was frustrated not to see kind of action on that. And then as an activist, I went back to those same elected officials and I told them the stories of people that weren't able to get out of their house to go to work during sunny day flooding events in Miami. And one elected official in particular, Congressman Carlos Curbelo, said, you can show me graphs and charts all day, but the most compelling piece of evidence that I have about the climate change impacts that we're dealing with are these stories. So please bring me more of these stories. It's just so interesting to me because you are bilingual. You are have probably spent your entire life code switching. So even after all that work to realize the language I am speaking, the language of science and graphs and charts, they don't understand. I have to code switch into this entirely different narrative language that's actually going to land. Yeah. And I think my experience as a Latina, as an immigrant, allowed me to be able to recognize when a code switch was needed and allowed me to make that transition in a more efficient way. Not to be like, but I've got another chart. Maybe that yeah. chart. <laughs> All I know is charts. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of your work now focuses on mobilizing communities of color around climate change. What's the most effective way to engage someone who either doesn't believe that they're impacted or believes it, but is just caught in the hustle of their job and providing for their family and getting through the day to day when where when you talk about, you know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, they're like, that's that's just a problem for another day. I think it's my approach. I don't have an issue that I care about so much that I'm trying to wiggle it into other people's lives. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. I'm seeing how people are being hurt 
by climate change, and I want to be there to help them make decisions. I talk about, like, for example, in 2018, this is the fourth hottest summer, and the other three were the last three years. Yeah. So we need to start talking about heat, and today it's really hot, and you don't have air conditioning, and what can we do to make your life better? And how can we take this opportunity to talk about the bigger picture of climate change and what we can do in the long run as a community? So that's kind of the conversation I'm trying to have. And the same happens with sea level rise. I do ground truthing on the days where we're more likely to see tidal flooding. And in, it's those days that I meet people that say, you know, I walked through this water yesterday. I had a wound and now it looks infected. Do you think it, there's something in the water? And I can say, well, let's call a researcher from FIU to come out here and test the water quality. And he says, yes, in fact, there's E. coli in this water. Mm. And we need to make sure that we let all the neighborhood know that they need to keep their kids and pretty much everybody needs to stay out of the water. So that's when it becomes useful. And that's the spot that I think is where the climate change discussion needs to be happening. There are some impacts that are already baked into the system that we can't avoid. And we need to learn to adapt and adapt in a way that's equitable. But we also need to do everything we can to prevent the worst. So that maybe if you buy a house in Miami that's not so close to the water, you might be able to have an investment in 30 years to pass on to your kids. Which is particularly relevant when you consider how much of Latinos' understanding of the American dream and middle-class wealth acquisition is tied to home ownership. Mm -hmm. I was involved in a survey that some folks came down and did in Miami several years ago, and they wanted to know what Cubans thought about climate change. And so they interviewed millennials, they interviewed kind of this gap generation mm -hmm. where they had come over when they were very small, the doctors, the lawyers of Miami, the elected officials, and then the grandmas, las abuelitas. And they found that of those three groups, guess which group was most concerned about climate change? I'm going to say the grandmothers because it's the most counterintuitive. You're right. It was the grandmothers because they said, you know, we went through so much. Mm. You know, we were displaced. And we came here to build a better life for our kids. And we did it. But now there's another threat. And what we worked so hard to build might be taken away. Not from us, but from our grandkids. Whew. I, I've cared about this issue for a long time. But I have to say, when I had my daughter, it became much more acute to me, my concern over it. Because I think there's a reality among those of us who are in our 30s or 40s, where it's like, I could probably be the last one to make it out of here okay. But then when you start hearing these years and these numbers that you're saying, it's like, well, that's that's my child. That's, that's her growing up in a world where her planet is in peril. It changes the sense of urgency around it. And I have to imagine for you, as a person who is dedicating your life to this, and as a mother, that those two concerns intersect. Very much so. I did an interview, and he, I said, he said, well, what if, what if you fail? And I said, well, if we avoid the worst and we're able to adapt in a way where we really kind of change our approach to things like equity and how we deal with the environment, if we do that, and I want my son to know I was a part of it, even just a small part of it, but part of it. And if we don't and we fail, I want him to know that I tried. And that's my message. The stakes are high. Damn it, Nicole. <laughs> you almost started. made it through this one. No, I know. It's, just, it's, that, it's the image of all those women who just sacrifice so much. Yeah. And the threats come in many forms. Mm -hmm. So we have an obligation, right? We have an obligation to our abuelitas that sacrifice so much for us. And we have an obligation to our kids that deserve that much, too. I sometimes worry that when we talk about climate change in the context of Florida or Texas, that then if you're living somewhere that's not Florida, Texas, you're like, sorry, guys, but not my problem. Well, first of all, Florida and Texas are probably going to be coming to you <laughs> in the next 15 <laughs> to 20 years. Yeah. And second of all, there is no get out of jail free card for anyone when it comes to climate change. We're all going to be dealing with either direct impacts so ocean acidification for folks that work in, for example, fishing industries, uh, storms for anybody that lives along the coast, um, 
sea level rise for folks that live along the coast as well, and heat, which is pretty much everybody. So I think to think that anyone is immune to the impacts of climate change is is, um, delusional. For me, I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to be able to contribute to this fight the way that you are. What does an ordinary person like myself, what can we do if we care about this issue? I feel like my biggest contribution to dealing with the climate change issue is not as a scientist. It's actually as a mom and as a Latina. And you're both. (laughs) And I think sharing the information, and we're so lucky, our community, poll after poll, shows that Latinos, more than anybody else, are aware of climate change and on board with dealing with the issue and are even willing to pay taxes or whatever it may be to help communities address climate change impacts. So do you believe that it fundamentally needs to be fixed at a policy level? And does that let us off the hook then for our personal consumption habits? All of it. How can we look at our kids and say we're fighting climate change and we're driving SUVs and eating steak every night and soaking up energy? It's hypocritical. You know, we need to kind of walk the walk. But do I have to become completely plant based? No, (laughs) I guess. But like no real talk. Like is that (laughs) like can I sit here and be like, I really care, but I love a burger. Like, do you have to make really hard choices? At some point, we're going to have to make hard choices. And, and what is that? The IPCC said we've got, what, like 11, now 10 years to do everything we possibly can to prevent the worst. So at what point are we going to make the real hard life changes to contribute to a different world? But if we're still going to be living like we've always lived, business as usual, you can look at the business as usual scenarios for IPCC and it's terrifying. IPCC is? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the UN's group of scientists that are working on climate change issues. What do you need me to do? Tell me. Tell me. And I'm serious. Tell me what to do. I mean, I think make the changes that you feel reflect your values in your life, right? So if you feel like, you know... This is not the type of person I am. I'm an all or nothing person. So just okay. give me the full all of it. Maloo. Yes, I just top to bottom. Reduce the amount of meat that you that you eat. Think about transportation, how you can reduce the amount of flying that you do, how can you not drive as much as you do? And if you're going to buy a house, think about energy efficiency and think about what you really need in terms of a house. Do you need a 5,000 square foot house or can 15,000 or 1,500 be okay? So I think making those kinds of decisions Mm -hmm. is really important. If you're going to be in a coastal community, find out kind of what the floodplain is. Find out what sea level rise projections look like for that area. There are a lot of resources from Climate Central and the Union of Concerned Scientists. You can actually go in and type your address, and it'll tell you your elevation and your vulnerability. So you can get that information. So make choices that encourage development in places that aren't as vulnerable to climate change. Then use whatever platform you have as a parent, as someone that works in media, to talk about the issue. Everyone has some sort of circle of influence. And of course, the most important thing is vote and put pressure on elected officials to make the high level policy changes that can really shift us towards kind of a a clean, renewable um, economy um, that's rooted in justice and equity. When President Obama was still president, First Lady Michelle Obama invited you to be her guest at one of his State of the Union addresses. Did you just pass out when you got that invite? Oh, oh yeah. I was, I couldn't believe it. The first thing I did was call my mom and tell her, we did it. (laughs) We did something really great. (laughs) Okay. And you also didn't say it to her in English. So tell me exactly how that call went down. Uh, Okay. Give me a minute. Because she passed away two years ago. I'm sorry. And so I'm going to take a No, take all the minutes. (laughs) No, this is just, who knew it was going to be the one on climate change that really wrecked us? I know. Um, yeah, I called my mom. And what did you say? I said, um, Viste, mamá, valió la pena. Todos los sacrificios. Val- I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be able to do this. <laughs> this is not going to happen. <laughs> I felt worth it. Yeah. I was like, you, you made so many sacrifices. And we, we did something great. It was nice. Yeah. And then when you met Michelle? Um, I actually stepped on her foot. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited, <laughs> um, and and I brought my mom, 
And I was like, Mom, who would have thought, you know, when we were on that plane from Guatemala, that one day we would go to the White House. And I had a picture. I wore a jacket, and there was a little pocket inside of it. And I had a picture because after we came to Guatemala, I was just terribly homesick. And my grandparents found a way to come over for a week. And they said, you should be so proud of your new country. We're going to take you to the White House. And so they took me to the White House, and I got an American flag, and I just felt really patriotic. And so I had that picture of my grandparents. They had since passed away, and I was holding an American flag in front of the White House. And so I took that in my pocket. And I said to my mom, I'm like, who would think that Guatemalans, you know, coming here struggling? We didn't even know how to turn the water on. Like, we had to, like, try to figure it out. And now we get to go to the White House. Like, we get to go inside. <laughs> it was amazing. And it gave me the opportunity to do a lot of media that I was able to leverage to get more attention on the environmental justice issues I was working on in Miami. What do you still want to do that you haven't done? <sighs> um... I feel like the issue of climate change is so, so huge. And I feel like what I've done so far is such a tiny contribution that I just want to continue to to work in that area. Um, so I think that's, that's something I, I want to continue to dedicate my life to. It's nothing very complicated or necessarily very ambitious, but at the same time, it's kind what? of... <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly ambitious. The just the the lovely thing for you is that every that these things have aligned for you, that your your natural gifts, your earned skills, your interests, and your sense of justice are now all in alignment. Where I think a lot of us struggle with the fact that those things don't always all line up. Yeah, I'm really lucky. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Latina to Latina was originally co-created with Bustle. Now the podcast is owned and executive produced by Juleka Lentigua williams and me. Maria Muriel was the sound designer on this episode. We want to hear from you. Tell us who you want to hear from and how you're making the show a part of your life. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. Remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening.